Hello. How you doing? Uh, this is Ed Gallo of the Fight Site, and uh, this is the Fight Site's MMA podcast. Normally, I'm joined by Shiram Raleidarn, who we all know and love. Uh, he's busy uh, becoming an accountant. I'm a little confused about if he is already an accountant or he's in the final stages of graduate school to become an accountant, but he's doing accountant stuff, uh, you know, being smart. So it's just going to be me. I didn't want to get a replacement. I just wanted to do it myself. Uh, we have a full card preview coming out for UFC 267 by uh, Fano and Dan Albert, and that's going to be really good and comprehensive. So you really don't need me to go through the upcoming card and break down every fight or anything like that, because they're going to do that for you. It's going to be great. They're going to do their research, unlike me. <laughs> um, what I can do, though, is I can talk to you a little bit about the card that just happened, uh, the Vittori versus Costa card. I think it had some good things to talk about. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the upcoming card and maybe there will be some topics that, uh, arise from that conversation that you might be interested to hear from me about, like we could talk about wrestling a little bit even, uh, but yeah, I'll just see how long it takes me to go through the, the recent fights and upcoming fights. Um, and if we're under an hour still, I can talk about some other things that have been interesting lately. I could talk about wrestling, um, in general as a sport. And I could talk about how I taught uh, my dog to wrestle. <laughs> Maybe if we if we make it to the end and it's a good time, um, I'll do that for you. No one asked for that. I just, I don't know. That's my idea of fun. So there you go. Uh, okay, so let's do it. Um, shout out to all my Fight Site patrons on Discord. If you're listening to this, let me know. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering who still listens. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, give me a lot of compliments. I like when you do that, so anticipating those compliments so shout out to them shout out to the fight site staff shout out to uh all you lovely people out there and especially that one guy who keeps commenting on all of our youtube videos there's always something about how we're gay it's uh i don't know how he does it he just has a way a way with words and i just it's great and it really makes me laugh and uh he keeps doing it and he keeps referencing things that are on the podcast so i know he listens um he's really listening um i don't know if he's listening just to find something to make fun of us for or if he's like a fan but he just wants to insult us i don't completely understand it but i'm treating it as support at this point it is it, it makes me happy i like it so keep it up man uh i should learn your name at this point but just, yeah funny funny that you do that <laughs> all right so uh, those are my shout outs for non-mma related things now let's do some shout outs for the cost of a tory card um Shout out to Paulo Costa uh, before the fight, before the fight, huge shout out. Just um, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Uh, there's like a clear. There's been so many cases of who do the rules apply to, who can afford to break the rules um, in the cage, outside the cage. Just like it's it's a mess. This sport, um, barely a sport, honestly, of it. <laughs> the rules do not make sense and they're not enforced except for you know of course when someone really can't afford to have them enforced on them uh so i don't know the business of why they would punish some people more than others or why how those decisions are made or what corruption could be at play um i believe there's definitely some level of corruption just because the decision making is often very baffling and it usually goes okay is it corruption or is it incompetence and sometimes it's a little bit of both i think that could probably be the case here but um, that doesn't really apply to this case too much but just in general with the way that ma is um organized <laughs> in general the commissions um everything like that uh, you know drug testing agencies there seems to be a lot of inconsistency uh but i think things were pretty much by the book here i just it goes to show you that if paulo costa can afford to not make weight if he can afford the cut of uh of his pay then he can just not make weight. And as, as long as he can get his opponent to still agree to fight him, he's going to fight him. And, you know, you're going to give up your potential win bonus and not take the fight that you've been training for for months. You're going to take it. Um, so he's using that situation against Vittori. Um, so shout out to him for exploiting the system. Um, I don't like how he exploited it because it hurt another fighter. Um, but it also helped another fighter because he, he gave them that money. He said, I will pay you extra <laughs> if I don't have to make weight. And uh, that was the arrangement he got. And uh, he got what he wanted. I think he said that he tore his bicep training and that's why he couldn't cut weight. And Vittori was like, I think you can cut weight with a torn bicep. 
I've never torn my bicep. I can't, I can't weigh in. I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, but yeah, then they fought and they fought the Tori and Costa and uh, it was a good fight. I was looking forward to it. Um, I thought they were going to bang in the simplest terms. I thought they were going to bang and they did. And they did. And my hypothesis last week was Sharam and he agreed uh, was that, you know, Costa is going to have a lot of opportunities to land, land big shots. And I think we, we thought he would get to them early. We thought it'd be more dominant early. Um, and then Vittori would put a pace on him and, and eat those and uh, make him back off and, and take over and uh, really gas him out. So in general, that kind of was the dynamic of the fight, but there are some major differences. One is that Costa was not in control early. Um, it was pretty competitive and um it's not like he wasn't trying to pressure. He was, he came out and tried to pressure right away, but he was trying to pressure low volume and not just like go big um, and, and throw and, and put people in place with big kicks and come after him. Uh, eventually he did that, but it wasn't at the same kind of uh, velocity that we're used to. It, it wasn't, um, it was much more measured, but that wasn't necessarily a good thing because what he was doing in between those moments was kind of nothing. Um, a lot of covering up, a lot of backing up, a lot of high guard. Um, which is something I posted a clip about how Yoel Romero kind of set up his wrestling around um, Paulo Costa's use of the high guard. So it's something that's been there uh, in past fights, I suppose, but uh, Vittori is the wrong guy to be like that with, because he's going to, he's going to put volume on you. He's going to be consistent. He's going to be active, uh, which is what I appreciate about him. Um, he's very, uh, I don't want to say he fu he's fundamentally sound because there's <laughs> what he does is kind of ugly, but um, the concepts, uh, he, he follows basic concepts very well and he puts uh, together a good game and uh, he's, he is functional. Um, and that's not something that you can totally say about Costa right now. I think uh, it's all colored by Vittori having a crazy chin and being able to walk through it all. Um, I mean, he got hurt by some things, definitely, but he, he took some nasty shots, especially to the body, uh, the body kicks he was eating fairly early on. Uh, it was so telling <clears throat> how the rest of the fight was going to go just based on how he was wearing those. Um, and even in the fifth round when Vittori was clearly wearing it, um, and Costa was <laughs> really digging him to the body and, and kicking him hard and, uh, trying to back him off and firing some crazy, uh, rear hands down the middle as well. He was doing well with that throughout the fight um he looked pretty accurate too it's a, a, a newish look for him uh that straight hitting uh, up high but i liked it um but anyway yeah i mean his offense looked pretty good his defense was just kind of a void i think you know in terms of optics it's really really hard to score the fight for costa just because he's backing up so much he's high guarding so much he's, his feet are sloppy he's sloppy um but a, a lot of Vittori's offense didn't actually land um, or didn't land very clean, or just there wasn't a ton behind it. Um, whereas most of what Costa lands was pretty substantial. And I think Vittori, not even no selling it, just being really durable makes it look less effective. So there's a whole conversation to be had about how fights are scored. You, if you remember my fight scoring series, Bad Calls, I talk about it, um, the damage criteria, the impact criteria, which is how you determine like how significant a strike is. And a lot of it is optics, and I don't like that. That is how it's written, um, but it's supposed to be like, if you can't tell, if you're having a hard time telling the difference in significance in a shot, look at how the other person reacts. Um, you should be able to tell that Paulo Costa hit him so, so freaking hard over and over again. Uh, that should be an eye test type of thing. You don't have to judge Vittori's reaction to know that he got hit super hard. Um, so I think that's where the disconnect might be a little bit. Um, and they don't score body work very well, which is unfortunate um, because so many great fighters that do most of their best work to the body and you're not going to give them credit for it. Um, I digress. But yeah, the overall dynamic of the fight was, was that, um, you know, Vittori's defense was fairly porous, but Costa wasn't doing too much, but his defense was uh, very exploitable. And uh, yeah, I mean, some good things were that Costa's cardio had a, uh, a floor. You know, it didn't just continue to crash until he couldn't move. He had a, like a baseline pace he could fight at while tired. And he stuck with that. And that actually was pretty cool. I don't know if that would have been the same if he cut to middleweight. Probably not. Um, so that's a big, a big factor there. That he was able to keep up with Vittori's pace just by being able to fight well while tired, which is cool. And I think against other fighters, it might have been worse for him. But Vittori wasn't doing a lot of body work himself. Um, and he didn't press the issue with wrestling because Costa's hips look great. 
and his shots were super high. <laughs> and if the guy has like a decent shot at like getting underhooks or pulling you up and he's super strong and he's got good hips and he's big, uh, no, you're not going to take him down shooting at hip level against the cage. Like that bothers me. It's always bothered me about Vittori. He shoots too high. Um, he was doing it against Holland too and getting away with it because Holland didn't know how to adjust to defend at that time. Um, but Vittori was doing a bad job. So there's a, there's a lot of situations where Vittori, I think, is a pretty, I don't know, go to this again, but like fundamentally sound wrestler. Um, that's not one of the ways. <laughs> that's not it. But um, yeah, I, know, I guess that encouraged him to, to keep what he was doing because it was working pretty well. But yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about Costa at this point. I mean, there's definitely, I, I know some smart people are arguing that he won, so that's cool. Um, but he, he didn't get the win. So you have to consider him on a skid now. And, uh, he's, his career looks a bit of a mess. I think go to two Oh five, you know, if you're comfortable there, seems like it, uh, he fought pretty well. <laughs> and I think the power would show up more against guys that aren't Marvin Vittori, even if they are bigger, but Vittori is huge too. Um, don't forget that. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I feel, but Vittori, I feel kind of the same about him, just even more sold on him as like a durable cardio bully. Um, but he did, <laughs> he was, he was in bad shape at the end of the fight, which understandable considering what he took. Um, but he's tough as hell. He's, a he's in a good zone with following his game plan and following directions well enough, uh, while still having some variation in his approach like i think that was my knock on him in the jack or manson fight is he just did the same thing over and over they both just did the same thing over and over for five rounds and it was so annoying um he, he mixes it up a little bit more now i think he's getting a little more depth to what he can do in terms of boxing which is cool um but then he's always got like the cordero stuff in his back pocket just like a one two a pull counter and a round kick um but that's you can do a lot with that so yeah no i uh it was a cool fight i i, I left feeling better about both of them i would say because costa i was like is he even gonna look like anything at this point like we don't know like what he was doing in the izzy fight and you're just like time is passing and like his hair is falling out and you're like oh, oh my god like is he gonna make it um but now he looked fine so yeah that's kind of cool uh, shout out to ricky glenn um well shout out to grant dawson for being better than i thought he was too because I, I hadn't watched much of him and i was like oh, i don't know like he's a wrestler a grappler type but who has he fought? Like, how is he getting these takedowns? How is he getting these top positions? But yeah, I mean, Ricky Glenn's a good grappler. Um, so to be doing as well as he was in the first two rounds, more power to you. But if you slow down a little bit, that dude, <laughs> that dude will get you. So, so much respect. Uh, don't you dare call him Rick. Don't you dare. It's Ricky, Ricky Glenn. Um, but he shout out to him. That was super cool how he came back there, um, earned that draw. I think, I think that was the right score. Um, and yeah, he, he put it on him in the, in the third round. I really appreciate it. And uh, what I love is uh, so many times in those types of situations where the other guy's gas, the other person's trying to get some offense. And I remember like um, it, was, it was on this card, I'm pretty sure. Maybe I'll remember eventually. But someone was gassed and they spent the third round. Uh, it might have been the Trinado Grant fight, actually. But they spent the third round very slowly getting to, to mount uh, in order to like open up for like the big, the big, I'm going to get this 10-8 or I'm going to get this finish, whatever type of threat. Um, and I think that was because Trinado was also exhausted. Um, but it's, it bugs me sometimes when um, the other person's tired and you need to exploit that. Uh, you got to be active. You got to make stuff happen. Like, it doesn't matter if you're doing it perfect. Just continue moving. Just don't stop moving. Like, don't <laughs> give them opportunities because you're going to beat them in those types of scramble situations if you're good. Um, <laughs> I guess it doesn't work for everybody, but um, for someone like Ricky Glenn, just to, to keep it moving, uh, keep hitting, keep threatening submissions and letting go and hitting and transitioning and uh, just make them keep getting tired, getting more tired. I mean, I'm like, okay, they're tired. Now let's try to finish them. It's like, no, you, you build on that. Um, and, and a lot of the time people do, and sometimes they don't. And I think that's a, a tactical thing that fighters need to work on. Um, but yeah, he got a 10, eight out of it. So you know, saved, saved the loss for sure. Um, shout out to both Alex Caceres and Tung Woo Choi. Um, that was a great fight. Uh, I was certain that Choi was going to knock him out after that first round. I'm like, okay, he's going to knock him out this round. And uh, this cool, cool little adjustment uh, just you know, came under his, uh, his rear hand into that duck under back take. Not super smooth like you would see from like Jan or like a, a really traditional like hard pivot, but he got there um, and he took his back and he, and he finished him. So 
uh, cool little career resurgence for Alex Caceres. I've always uh, liked him, even if he's not, you know, traditionally good. But and, and Choi, I think, is pretty solid as well. Just, you know, didn't have a lot of depth or experience there in grappling situations, but I like him on the feet too. Um, yeah, and maybe he could push the issue a little bit more sooner, um, considering he needs to show a little bit more urgency. If that's going to be the gap in his grappling, in his wrestling, I think maybe be a little bit more aggressive and maybe. Uh, be a little bit more varied with your shot selection, you know, faint a little bit more, but more active pressuring fainting. So you can get off more volume uh, while being more careful. I would say that would be a good, a good adjustment to make. Cause he's, he's money in the pocket. Uh, he just needs to get you in that range. Um, so walking people down, trying to cover the distance, that's when you can exploit it the most uh, if you're looking to wrestle and grapple. So something for him to keep an eye on, but I, I, I think he could be pretty, pretty good. I don't know if he did his military service already. Did he? Let's find out. Um, he is 28. So I don't, don't know. Don't know when they, because I think they can postpone, right? Like some of them have been doing it kind of late. Um, I don't see any big gaps in his resume. There's a two-year gap uh, before he fought Ivloyev in his UFC debut. Um, so could be that, but yeah, he fought every year other than that. So I don't know. Um, Keep an eye on him. But yeah, shout out to Ronaldo for being old uh, and still winning. It's pretty cool. Um, anybody else? Of course, Gregory Rodriguez. Uh, I picked him out on the last card. It was my first time watching him. And I was like, I like this guy. Like he's got, uh, he's clearly very powerful. I mean, he hits the body. He can wrestle well. He's he's a top player. Um, yeah, he, I of course, of course, he's a hoofed guy. That's like the style I gravitate towards. Um, but I didn't know that until after but I liked him. And then what I also didn't know until after was that he had lost in the contender series. <laughs> and then uh, Fanyo was like, yeah, yeah, like the guy he lost to like, wasn't that good. And then he started gassing in the fight and like, Oh no, like did I hitch my, hitch my wagon to the horse. Do you hitch wagons to horses? Do you hitch horses to wagons? Help me out. Let me know. I hitched something to something wrong. I thought, uh, but then he won. So I was like, all right, cool. He can win gassed and that's fine. Uh, so <laughs> here we go again. Uh, gas tank, Greg, uh, fighting the iron turtle looking awesome awesome early like body hunting uh on the counter body hunting and uh, just looking great and transitions into wrestling grappling were great and he was owning him and then he got tired and he backed off and he was sitting duck against the cage and he was covering up and he was looking a little worse for for it and then uh countered him right right in the middle uh just a bunch of times just smashed him in the face repeatedly uh, and put him out on his feet and just that rear hand <laughs> assault like Andre Arlovsky. Um, on, honestly, like Andre Arlovsky from a few years ago, not uh, he's been using both of his hands recently. Arlovsky has, so shout out to him as well. Um, but yeah, I, that's I, I love Gregory Rodriguez. He's I don't know what his ceiling is because he's middleweight, so he could be better than you'd expect with even pretty big flaws with like with, like, with the gassing, but um, yeah, no, I, I support him. Uh, Mason Jones versus David Onama. Shout out to both of them. Um, I made fun of David Onama before the fight because the only thing I could find about him was that he was the number four ranked uh, featherweight, I think, or lightweight in Kansas, Missouri, um, which sounds like it means nothing. That's the joke. But no, he's tough. He was pretty good. He did some good stuff. Um, I thought, you know, the urgency made him look a little sloppy maybe, or maybe he is a little sloppy. So I guess I'll keep an eye on him for his next fight to see what he's actually like. And Mason Jones, like I said, he's a cardio bully and he's a chin bully. That's what it was. And uh, he, his, his takedowns were cool. I like the transitions into the clinch positions into the quick throws. That's awesome. Uh, I admit it <laughs> for all you discord patrons who like Mason Jones. Um, he still got beat up by Mick Davis though. That still happened. Uh, shout out to Tabitha Ritchie for uh you know, all, every, everything. It's just a big shout out. No need to elaborate, right? Just, uh, no, no, she's really aggressive. Um, definitely over swinging on a lot, but uh, really, very aggressive on the feet. Uh, can actually transition to the wrestling pretty well, uh, pretty functionally, and looks like a great grappler. So um, excited to have her around, and she seems cool. And uh, yeah, excited about that. Uh, mm. Jeff Molina, shout out to him. He's impressive. He doesn't look like much, but he's impressive. So I like that fight. I like him. Keep on, keep on doing it. Let's see what you got. Um, 
that's it for now. Uh, Jonathan Martinez one. I, I like him, but uh, that fight was a little strange. Um, yeah. And I don't want to get my hopes up about him again, just cause he, he, he took some lumps, but yeah, I, I have good feelings about Jonathan Martinez. All right. So that was that uh, card and I'm not going to do as much for this card or as many fights for this card at this upcoming card, but I will talk about it. Um, start with the fight I'm most interested in, which is, uh, the Bantamweight interim title. Is that it? Yeah. The interim Bantamweight title, uh, Peter Yan versus, uh, Corey Sandhagen. So basically Peter Yan's the best Bantamweight in the world. He beat up Aljamain Sterling, but he cheated. So he didn't get to win. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, we, in terms of measuring who's better than the other people, then, you know, it's him. Um, cause he, beat him up and didn't look like he was ever on his way to losing that fight at all. Looked like he was on his way to finishing that fight. I think there was going to be a point where Aljamain Sterling didn't get up again. Um, he was, he was exhausted. He was beaten up in all sorts of different ways. He was, he was not doing well. And I think uh, what my take was around the time is when he got hit with that illegal shot and he had to stop um, for a while. I think the adrenaline wore off a little bit and he felt everything he was feeling. And he's like, no, I can't, I can't keep fighting. Um, and I think that has as much to do with the illegal knee as it does to do with everything that happened to him before the illegal knee. Um, so I wouldn't say he was playing it up. I would say it's, it was more complicated than just the knee made him not able to keep going. Um, but it's a foul. It's a foul regardless. So you can't win <laughs> if you, if you cheat, uh, fair enough, but he, he did, he did win. Um, so now we have what would have been that fight. Uh, then Sterling can't get cleared, uh, cause he has, some surgery coming up that he won't be able to fight with or some something conditional where he's not allowed to fight, but he can still train. Um, doesn't hundred percent make sense to me, but I haven't looked into it that seriously. Um, and then Sandhagen steps in, you're like, okay, it's either going to be Sandhagen, Aldo, uh, Rob font, <laughs> Dillashaw, one of these guys. So a lot of really exciting matchups you get Sandhagen. Um, and, you know, he's coming off the Dillashaw fight, which a lot of people thought he won. I think I think maybe he did. I think maybe he did win um, the Dillashaw fight. But it was a very impressive performance by Dillashaw, um, especially afterwards, knowing what he was working with in terms of injuries. Um, it seemed like they were very limiting with his what he could do in the fight, especially as a wrestler, which I think, you know, is a little asterisk there. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to take away anything from Corey Sandhagen. It's already been taken from him because he got robbed. Uh, but <laughs> I'm just saying, like, the way that TJ was able to initiate a lot of the wrestling grappling sequences was pretty easy. Um, and then, you know, I think just not being able to bend his knees as much as he wanted to was simple enough a reason to make it a lot harder to wrestle this tall guy. Um, and that's pretty significant. And I think he had some shoulder stuff too, and he was getting pulled up easily on underhooks, and he, he looked a little weaker than... Um, I expected in the situations that were Sandhagen looked stronger rather. So that had me, uh, that had me thinking at the time that, okay, maybe this isn't quite as impressive from a defensive wrestling grappling, uh, perspective as it would have been had I known that TJ Dillashaw had a full use of his body. Um, cause it makes a big difference. It really does. And it's, it's pretty crazy that he felt comfortable enough to still fight this guy. Um, if he was dealing with that level of injury, but, um, I think he hadn't fought in a long time and he really, really needed to get it and uh, work through it. I think that's probably what happened. Um, but yeah, Sandhagen's really impressive. Um, he impressed me like on purpose fighting on the back foot, which, you know, I don't like um, for MMA right now, but he was doing good. He was, he was cutting quick angles, uh, using a lot of lateral, lateral movement. He's really hard to track down and he's doing that cool thing where he uh, uses his lead hand as a, as a feeler, uh, puts out a lot of volume with it, a lot of feints gets your head moving and cracks you with the left hook or herds you into, into some big shot. Uh, he, he, he hit TJ with that at some point in the third round. He had him weaving into it. Uh, really, really clanked him on the chin there. Um, but yeah, he was knocking TJ around a good bit with uh, his work outside the guard, which was pretty cool. Um, he was looking heavy handed. He was looking strong. Um, you know, a little, a little kickable maybe, but uh, you know, he was looking pretty good. Um, yeah. It was a nice performance from him. So I think he's coming off some momentum even though he has a loss. So it makes sense for him to get the fight. And uh, yeah, I think uh, he's game. I don't give him no chance, but I think he's going to lose. Uh, and I like him. I'd like to meet him someday. In fact, I really like him. I think he's a cool guy too. Um, yeah, I think he's going to lose. Uh, 
if if Peter Jan did have the win over Aljamain Sterling officially, I think there would be a case for him being top three pound for pound. I think he's, in terms of ability, I think he's top three pound for pound for sure. I think he's so impressive. Uh, I would say he's probably the most offensively skilled fighter in UFC history, uh, in MMA history. I think the, you know, cumulative <laughs> amount of his offense is uh, unparalleled. I, I really do. Like, he's probably the best pressure fighter in MMA right now. Uh, he's one of the best offensive wrestlers in MMA right now. He's one of the best defensive wrestlers in MMA right now. Um, his top game is brutal. If you haven't seen the Douglas Silva DeAndraj fight or even like the Dodson fight, um, he's good. He's good at everything. And it's not like his defense isn't good. <laughs> his defense is very good and he's a great counterfighter as well. But I just wouldn't say like best in the UFC, um, like his other uh, skills are more offensively oriented. Uh, attributes are elite. Uh, crazy endless cardio uh, very strong very functionally strong very agile um, quick um, good reflexes just he's he's got it he's got it he's the full package he's he's so scary he's super durable his body is unbreakable um, you can just go nuts on his body and it doesn't matter apparently which is terrifying because uh, he's this cardio guy You're like i'll oh, slow him down can't <laughs> um, so i think it's a nightmare and um, of course sandhagen's a cool guy for him to fight just because sandhagen um, I don't think he's going to be intimidated by him on the feet. I think he'll fight him. I think he's going to hit him and I think he'll have success, but I also think he's going to get walked down. I think he's going to get hit in the body. I think he's going to get kicked in the leg. Um, I think he's going to get herded into corners. I think he's going to have some bad moments on the back foot. I think he's going to have some good moments in the back foot. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, I think Jan's going to be able to transition into upper body situations uh, either via his hand fighting. If he's like pressuring Sandhagen up to the fence and he gets him there, he can reach out and grab his hands. Um, and initiate some sort of tie up and even go off of that into a shot, which he's good at. Um, but I think if he gets to the legs, he's, he's going to be taking him down um, depending on what, what the situation is. But yeah, I, I think he's going to wrestle. I think he's going to go upper body a lot. I think he's going to go with body locks, foot sweeps, stuff like that. Um, because Sandhagen's so willing to try to <laughs> peel your hands off the back kind of um, as his defense and just like get you on his back and just go for the one defense that he's confident in. Uh, or like try to funk roll and scramble, which he was doing again against Dillashaw and he ended up in some good leg lock situations. But again, we don't know exactly how effective that is just because Dillashaw might have been uh, not 100%, but I don't know. Uh, just San Higgins' defensive choices uh, as a wrestler and grappler, I think, you know, for the amount of time that he's been doing MMA, it's super crazy impressive. Um, but just he's in a really tough division to not have that be your main skill um or have any sort of hole there and yeah i think jan's gonna exploit that i think jan's gonna win the fight as a grappler i think he'll do plenty well on the feet he probably he'll probably even win on the feet uh considering that um and i think san higgins in the game i don't think he's gonna get broken down um uh, and finished via attrition necessarily um i don't think he'll be finished at all but i think he's gonna lose a lot of time to win uh because of his uh you know Honestly, they're, they're tactical uh, mistakes because I know he knows how to defend takedowns normally because I've seen him do it against Dillashaw. Um, but he's still, uh, a lot of the situations, there was like a solid amount of time where he was, had his back uh, to Dillashaw and, and gave it um, to transition out of a bad shot. So I don't know. I don't like it. And I think uh, it's going to bite him here just considering how Jan approached the Sterling fight and how he's wrestled offensively in other fights uh, for you know, five, six years now. Um, so I think he's, he's a big threat there. And I think he's been wrestling more and more considering who's, who he's dealing with. Um, and just, you know, in a division where strikers are on the rise, he's going to have a huge weapon to, to exploit that and make those matchups more complicated for people. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be a great fight and I think Allen's going to win. Um, the main event, I, I'm really, I don't want to do any disservice here because I like both uh, Jan Blakowicz and I like Glover Teixeira and I don't want to uh, demean them by giving shallow analysis if I haven't really looked into it deeply. The basic thing I think is that Jan is way better than him on the feet and he's going to hit him hard and he's going to rock him. I just have this little doubt that if Glover like does like scramble up to a single off of being rocked and like does end up taking Jan down, um, it could change things. It could change things. I don't remember seeing Jan on his back since the Gus fight, and he looked like he didn't know what to do off his back in the Gus fight, and that would be a bad thing <laughs> if you're fighting Glover Teixeira. 
Um, and we know Glover doesn't, he doesn't forgive you know, if he gets top position and you're not uh, ready to, to go with him at, at a good pace. Um, you're not going to be strong. You're not going to be active. Like he's, he's going to get into good positions. He's going to beat you up. And I think that's a hard thing to come back from. And even a well-conditioned light heavyweight, if you get beat up really badly, uh, you're going to be faded. <clears throat> and it's going to be easier to do it to you again and again and again. And if you, you know, are getting sloppy and trying to get up in bad positions, then Glover could, could hurt you. Um, he still hits really hard. And I think he's very dangerous. Um, but yeah, Jan is more dangerous. And I think uh, he's more reliable overall at this point. So I'm, I'm picking him to win, but I can't, can't quite shake the feeling that Jan might have some issues off his back still, just because we don't know enough from last time we saw him there. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind, but I'm picking him. Uh, Mahachev and Hooker, I got a weird feeling about it um, because I've seen Hooker like get out-wrestled by Dustin Poirier, but I've also seen Islam look kind of um, okay to take his time on the feet. And a lot of his wrestling entries are just kind of timing and just having the right distance and just taking a shot or, you know, having people be easily pressured and working on the cage. That's also there sometimes, but, um, and he, I mean, he's good once he gets into those situations. I have no knock on him once he gets into those situations. I'm just thinking like, maybe this could turn into a fight for that Dan Hooker could win. That is because, you know, Makachev might be backed up a little bit more easily than we're expecting. Um, and Hooker looked like he knew the basics of how to keep somebody on the back foot in his last fight. Obviously, um, he went there himself. Hawk Bros went there. That was the first thing he did was he backed up. Um, but Hooker was doing a good job keeping him there. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to feel. I, my, my lean is that Makachev wins. Um, I really can't unsee Hooker <laughs> getting top game by Dustin Poirier, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm looking forward to that one just because if Hooker can make it a fight, that's cool. Because uh, it would be kind of exciting if that's the type of person that's testing Islam, because you know you get more excited about him fighting the elite guys. Um, because it's not like okay, like is this gonna be a depressing thing where no one can deal with him? <laughs> like because they just don't have the depth as as grapplers. But I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think um, this fight might not be competitive. But I think if you know Makachev fights like Oliveira or something like that, it's gonna be competitive um, <laughs> at the very least. So um, yeah, that, that'll be an interesting one. I'm interested to see Shumayev. I don't think uh, the leech is the right person to test him in the way that I want him to be tested because he did kick a guard wrestled by Neil Magny. Um, so it's like, okay, maybe he'll just get easily wrestled. Um, but I don't know. He's a good enough fighter overall that maybe he could make it a little more competitive than a John Phillips or a uh, Reese McKee, which I think, uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope you put up a better fight than that. Um, yeah, we'll see. I'll, I'll have more to say about him afterward because I, I, I don't know enough. Hmm. Anything else that really jumps out to me that I want to talk about? No, I mean, there's other cool stuff on this card. There's a lot of cool stuff on this card, but I'm going to leave it to the, to the full preview to dig into the rest of it. Um, so, yeah, that's it for MMA talk for me right now. Uh, what's been going on? The Olympics. Didn't talk about it. Didn't podcast about it. Said I would. Uh, I'm not going to do it now, but <laughs> uh, feel free to ask me questions about, uh, you know, anything that happened during Olympic wrestling that you're curious about. Um, I'll probably be able to talk about it, but see, I might not do it necessarily on the podcast, but like on Twitter, if you want to talk about it, I'll do it. Uh, the big thing is the upcoming college season. Also the past world championships. Um, that's definitely something to talk about, but the upcoming college season is going to be cool. I'm in a, a, a fantasy like dynasty league that uh, Jack, who is with the site oldest and greatest, he just started it. Um, that's going to be kind of cool. I, um, I drafted unprepared. <laughs> and I just kind of tried to make the best decision at the time without knowing a ton of what I was going to do. Cause like, all right. So everyone gets approximately five years in college to wrestle uh, like a red shirt year and four, four years as a starter. But uh, last year was a COVID year. So they kind of didn't count it against eligibility. So a lot of people are like returning fifth year seniors who are getting another year. Um, so I only put one senior in my lineup. Um, I got two juniors and I mostly drafted sophomore, uh, sophomores and freshmen. Um, so my team's not like super strong right now because there's a lot of people that I think are going to grow into being the top guy at their weight or like good prospects that could 
uh, replace my starters right now, but I'm feeling pretty good. David Carr is the leader of my team. I had the second pick and I took him uh, and Gable Stevenson was still on the board. And I took David Carr because uh, David Carr is a sophomore and I know he'll wrestle at least two more years uh, after this. And uh, he's probably going to win multiple national titles. And I think he'll only score more points as it goes. So I think that was a good choice. And I got on up other, some other exciting guys, but I'll keep it to myself for now. But once they started doing well in the season, uh, that'll be uh, something to talk about. Um, also in terms of wrestling, you can, you can treat this like the official announcement. We'll do a real official announcement once we have our graphics sorted out. But for the few of you who listen to this, um, so you know the NIL changes um, with college athletes being able to make money off their likeness. Um, that was huge, right? So as soon as that passed, it's like, oh, okay, the fight site is going to sponsor college wrestlers. Like, <laughs> no doubt we're going to do that. Um, so we're doing it. Um, most of the sponsorships that we're going to announce are people I'm friends with, but they are division one wrestlers and they're starters. And, um, some of them have wins at the national championships. So they're pretty good and it's going to be fun to root for them and, uh, you know, talk to them. They're going to be here on, on podcasts talking about themselves and the college season, just whatever we want to talk about. And they're cool guys and they're funny guys and you're going to like hearing from them. Uh, so it's going to be a bunch of my friends who are good college wrestlers and then a new friend who is a very good college wrestler. Um, and we posted about it. So I guess cats are kind of already the bat out of the bag already, but it's Jake Wenzel. Uh, he wrestles for the university of Pittsburgh, which is division one. Uh, they wrestle in the ACC and he was a national finalist last year. And he's a two-time ACC champion. Um, he's had dealt with a lot of injuries in his career. Uh, this will be his last year of eligibility. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he had a great run at the NCAA tournament. He had a, a big undefeated streak at the end of his season. Uh, last year he's so good on top he's he's a pennsylvania guy um just really probably the best at riding in college right now best at like retaining control um he does do jujitsu he is interested in mma um he's so strong <laughs> he's a great grappler uh, he trains with my friend alan uh sometimes and alan's a, an undefeated amateur fighter also very strong um <laughs> also very good um but yeah so he, he tells me all about him and uh, yeah, I was just really excited to have the opportunity to talk to him. And I, I talked to him through Alan and um, yeah, he, he agreed <laughs> to be, to be an official uh, fight site athlete. And he's got some cool sweatshirts now and he's going to do these podcasts with us. And yeah, we're probably going to interview him separately and I'll try to follow his career uh, this season as much as possible. I'll, I'll, I'll do some Patreon stuff about it. I might just follow Pitt in general. Cause that's my alma mater and I'm a big fan of their wrestling team. So maybe that'll be my contribution for the year, just because, uh, you know, I'm still very busy with the rest of my life, work and school and, and a lot of other stuff. Um, so I can't contribute the way I did, you know, a few months ago, like what you were used to from me. That's probably never going to happen that, at that rate ever again. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it while it lasted, but I'll still try to do things from time to time when I can. Um, and yeah, that'll be something I, I, a goal of mine is I'll try to do a lot of pit wrestling stuff and cover our sponsored athletes and what I'm really hoping for. So if you're listening to this, this is kind of my call for you to, um, if you are thinking about subscribing and becoming a patron, I would really love it because, um, the amount of money we make right now is, is it's good. Um, it's very impressive. It's awesome from where we started. Um, it's enough to cover a few of our staff's efforts, um, semi appropriately. Uh, it's really not that much. And, you know, I don't pay myself, um, the money's always gone to the, to the staff, but, um, what I would really like to do is be able to like put up prize money for some of these tournaments that they're wrestling at and, you know, set little goals for them and like allow them to win cash money for, uh, wrestling in college tournaments. I think that would be very cool. Um, and I could try to contact some other people that spend money on wrestling and uh, maybe try to get them to match it and we could we could make these guys some money but I, th I think that'd be very cool um but you know if we just had money in the bank from patreon or you know buying merchandise even i think that would be uh very helpful in order to do that so if you can do that um please consider supporting us on patreon i mean there's a, a lot you can get out of it so it's not like it's charity um there's a lot of exclusive content there's our discord server um and the newest thing is uh, we have a jujitsu instructional. Uh, it's a guillotine system from a black belt uh, named Gene uh, Sikirsky, uh, who's friends with Ben and trains with Ben. So he uh, did this instructional with Ben and Matt. Um, 
are grappling uh, writers. So it's, it's very good. Um, it's a very unique grip that he teaches and he shows you all the different ways to get it from different positions and just how to use it in general. Um, but he's like a guillotine master. <clears throat> so if you like choking people, <laughs> that's probably a good one to get. So um, if you subscribe at the, I think, $50 tier, you get access to that. You can also just buy it outright um, through a link that we have, that, or you can just actually contact me directly um, or the Fight Site account directly um, if you just want to buy it, but it'll be $10 more expensive um, just to encourage you to go through Patreon instead so you can consider sticking with us at a, at a lower rate, obviously, but then you get to see all the content. You'd be like, oh, the content's so great. I'll be here as a $3 patron from now on. Um, and that's, you know, that's the goal. So just wanted to plug that um and announce that news and that was pretty cool and then um uh, i guess we're at the end and it is under an hour so i'll tell you a little bit about how i wrestle my dog uh so my dog is toasty she's about 25 pounds and i've been wrestling her with, with her since i got her she i got her when she was eight weeks four pounds and i've just been getting her used to you know being rolled around and moving her limbs around and flipping her over and just messing with her and just getting her really used to the exposure of, you know, a little bit of rough housing, but I've always been very careful with her. Um, I've tested like the way that her, her limbs move and, you know, just make figuring out what her limits are, like not hurting her, just like feeling how flexible certain things are. Um, just got a good feel for her early on. Cause I, I wanted a dog I could wrestle with. So I started right away. And I think that's probably important is that you train a puppy uh, to wrestle. But if you have a dog that's smart and likes to learn and likes to play already, you could definitely work on that. So I, I would say that's step one. Um, step two is I figured out what games she likes to play. And early on, when she was teething a lot, when we would pet her and get her excited, she would start you know nibbling on our hands a little bit, like especially like my fingers. Um, so <clears throat> I had to teach her to not do that, obviously. But it was one of those things where like I had to tell her to stop and you know get back into it. And if you get her riled up again, she might start doing it again. And you can keep telling her to stop but she doesn't bite that hard. Like she, it's like playful and, you know, I kind of, I, I don't mind it. Uh, she can bite me a little bit and she never bites anyone else other than me. So it's like, okay, we could do this. This is, could be a game that we play as you bite my hand. Uh, so I get her, I get her worked up and I have her bite in my hands. And uh, that's kind of how it starts. Is she's trying to get to my hands and I'm trying to do stuff to her. Um, so I have to be mindful. So like her hand, her mouth is her hands essentially. So we're hand fighting if I'm trying to like get, get on her collar, like pull her head down a little bit, you know, bop her a little bit, pull on her feet, you know, ankle pick her a little bit. She's trying to, you know, bite my hands while I'm doing that. So um, that's, that's how we practice uh, originally is I, I, I move her around a little bit. I snap her down a little bit. Um, not hard. Just pull on her head, get her, get her tired. Cause your dogs will get tired <laughs> faster than people will. If you, if you keep pulling down their head and making them pick their head up and you know, move them around and with a dog, her size is pretty easy. Um, so, you know, I just do basic wrestling stuff. I just, you know, pick at her ankles a little bit, pull on her head a little bit, you know, reach for her, make her run around, try to get her tired. And then I start putting her out of position. And, you know, you probably already know the ways to knock your dog over. Like <laughs> everyone knows their dog's balance really well. And everyone knows like when their dog likes to roll over. Um, Cause she doesn't mind being knocked over. She tries not to, she tries her best, but when she's on her back, she just keeps fighting off her back and it's crazy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very funny, but um, yeah, I mean, everyone knows about where they can knock their dog over so pick your techniques based on that but she's like very resistant to having her legs grabbed like she's really good at kicking out if i grab her legs so i pretty much never take her down like that um i try to take her down into like referees positions i can get behind her and then i complete the the takedown in some way um like roll her over and get her in a, a scoring position but yeah so most of what i do is i just you know try to fake her out with the hand fight, pulling her head a lot, and then start to like pull her back legs. Uh, you can also arm drag and and bring them close and get like around where the lat would be, and pull and get into a referee's position. But you want to get behind them because uh, obviously that's where dogs re recognize that as a takedown too. Um, once you're behind them, you want your rear leg to be up and your uh, near leg to be you know blocking on that side. And I really recommend cross wrist control on a dog. So go underneath their body get out outside here um, and pull that in a little bit. And then what you can do is because you have that leg up on the other side, you can be careful. You can move over them and kind of roll over and tuck that leg that was up underneath their leg to push their leg off the ground. 
and you already have that cross wrist, you just pull that in and there's nothing here. There's no legs sticking out here. So you can just roll them over like that. And then you just reach across like the waist to the ribs or something like that. So you got your cross wrist, you got your grip across the, the body there. And uh, you can use your legs to keep their, uh, their back legs elevated. You got yourself a tilt there. You got yourself a cross wrist tilt. Uh, you got the tight waist and the cross wrist. And you uh, just take away their posts on that side and you just roll right through. You get some back points on your dog. And uh, I, I found that to be the most effective turning combination um, on a dog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, I just kind of hand, hand fight my way into little uh, drags, into go behinds, then I hit tilts. Um, or I just let her go or I'll uh, switch to a side headlock and I'll, I'll give her little noogies. She doesn't like that. Uh, that encourages her to get away. But yeah, it's just a fun little game that we play. And uh, I don't know if anyone's seen the video I posted, but recently I've been like trying to get her to jump at me. Um, so if I put my hands like up here and she'll come after them a little bit, I've been like doing to Yoel Romero, like high guard. Um, and when I put the high guard up, she's been, she's been jumping on me and I, that's pretty funny. Uh, sometimes I'll get her to jump up and I'll come underneath her and I'll, I'll hit a duck under, but I need a lot of room to do that. Um, that's my other move is if I'm like, even on my feet a little bit, I can get her chasing me. I can hit a cool, uh, a cool duck under and, and uh, cut an angle on her and, and get a go behind. I have a video of that too, of uh, me hitting one on her. But the other thing I do to her, and I only do this when there's a, um, like a really soft surface. If I'm like a, on a bed or on mats or something like that, something I know where it's not going to hurt if she hits her back a little bit. Um, she's very durable. She fell down the stairs when she was a little puppy. She fell down all the stairs and she hit every stair and she was totally fine when she got up at the bottom. So uh, I got a good read on, <laughs> good read on her durability. Um, but yeah, another thing I do is um, this like cool, like cross block uh, across, outside the knee. Uh, basically, you know, you're snapping your dog down, you stuff her, you pull her in a little bit, maybe by the front legs and get front headlock and get your chest a little bit on the back of their head. Not a lot of weight, just like on your knees, just pressing down a little bit, depending on the size of your dog. Maybe you need to do a real front headlock. Um, but you just uh, block with this arm to, to keep them in place and to keep the front headlock. Then you reach across outside. Uh, so you're going to get your hand outside the outside of their knee on the far side. So for me, I have my left arm across my chest down and I'm reaching across outside her right leg. Um, and basically you just pull this way and you push this way and you block, block that knee and, and tilt them over. And, uh, yeah, she just falls, <laughs> falls, rolls over, you know, feet to back four points. Um, but yeah, it's pretty effective. It's pretty effective. That's, uh, and you know, when I'm on like not a soft surface, I'll just hit a little one. And I'll move her feet over and I'll reach over and I'll grab and I'll pull her in and then I'll have that control again. But yeah, obviously only do this if your dog likes it. <laughs> See, if your dog doesn't seem to enjoy it, they don't force them to wrestle with you. But that's why I'm saying find a game that they like that you could turn into wrestling because like that's the only reason it works is because she wants to be biting my hands and I'm doing all this stuff where she can't bite my hands anymore and she's trying to get free so she can bite my hands again. Um, that's her entire motivation is to bite me. Uh, so. <laughs> you have to figure that out like what is the system what why are we playing um and then you can mix it up however you want to um but yeah she likes it and she likes being touched and like messed around with and that's what i'm saying like when she's little um I, I did all that stuff to her so she would be you know used to being roughhouse with so that's my advice um i, I would say if you're raising young children maybe it's similar <laughs> but i don't know i haven't done that um but yeah, that's, uh, that's how I got Toasty to wrestle with me. And she's a natural. Uh, she wrestles with other dogs all the time, and she does stuff I didn't teach her. So she's good. She's good. I think I really hammered home that we should have our hands all over each other, you know, really pulling each other down, um, you know, getting getting crazy uh, on with the collar ties and the snaps and just really heavy hands all the time. And that's how she, she wrestles these other dogs. She's always jumping up, getting her hands on them, and it, they, she breaks them down. She puts them out of position. And it, uh, it works great. It works great. That's uh, that's supposed to be Iowa style, like a lot of shots, a lot of heavy hands, a lot of activity. Um, so yeah, she's uh, she's a natural. She's a little American wrestler. Um, so I don't know why I'd, I shared that, but hopefully a couple of you enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, to go check out my uh, my Twitter profile. I have a little video there of me wrestling with her recently. And if you go way back, there's a bunch more. But uh, that's it for now. But yeah, that was my. This is my solo podcast. Um, it's hard to do this without being carried by Shuram with actual technical knowledge of fights. Cause he's, you know, he's good. He's good. He, uh, he's always ready. <laughs> I have to do a lot of research before I'm ready to talk about 
certain things, but I can always just uh, ramble about stuff I already know. So hopefully that's good content. Yeah, but yeah, uh, stick around for next week because there's another um, cool card that we get to preview. And I think we'll have a fun time with that. So yeah, it should be a good one. And we'll have a cool card to recap beforehand. It's going to be loaded. And we might even have other people here. There might be guests. We'll, we'll find out. I don't know. Okay, bye.